Hi, everyone. I'm French. So I'm going to have to say I'm so sorry. Happy Bastille Day. Uh, if you know what I'm talking about, today is the national uh, event in my country. Uh, so happy Bastille Day if you're French. Uh, but more important than Bastille Day, today we are having a special session uh, with Brad Feld. I'm going to tell you a lot about him in a minute. Uh, very excited to welcome all of you. We're talking about hundreds of you right now uh, with us on Cropcast. So this is awesome. Uh, lots, we, lots of things we want to talk about. I am Maël Gavé. I'm the CEO of Techstars. I joined the company 18 months ago. I am an entrepreneur. I, uh, I built three businesses. And then after that, I was like, okay, enough. I want to do something else. But the love that I have for entrepreneur never really stopped, which is why I'm so, so excited uh, to be now at Techstars and talking to so many, uh, so many entrepreneurs. I believe deeply in uh, the motto of Techstars, which is that we believe that entrepreneurs can change the world. And what we're doing is trying to help all of them, all of you, because I'm sure most of you are entrepreneurs, uh, all of you succeed. Uh, we have more than 50 accelerator programs in 18 countries. Uh, we now have uh, more than 3,000 graduate companies all around the globe, uh, 6,000 mentors, 1,500 community programs annually uh, that have touched over 100,000 participants a year. So very, very excited. And we were founded 15 years ago by a group of really smart people. And we have one of them with us today. Uh, which is Brad Feld. He's, he's one of our, the four co-founders of Techstars and he's been an early stage investor and an entrepreneur since 1987. He is the co-founder of the VC firm Foundry. And before that, he did a bunch of other stuff. He's a, also a writer, he's a speaker on, a, on topics around venture capital investing and entrepreneurship. Uh, he's written a number of books. Uh, I would really encourage you to check a couple of them, Startup Revolution, anything. He, you just published one. I'm sure you're going to talk about it regarding uh, boards. Um, I, have, I have a lot of them here. You can't probably see them, but anyway. And so without further ado, Brad, hi, hi, hi. Happy Bastille Day. Can you introduce yourself and, and give us a more detailed view of your background? Sure. Happy Bastille Day to you. I've been, as Miles said, I've been an entrepreneur since uh, 1987, which I guess means I'm, I'm getting old. Uh, whenever I say I'm old, my mother gets upset about that. So uh, I refer to myself in front of her as solidly middle-aged. Um, I've been through lots of ups and downs. I've had plenty of successful companies, both as an entrepreneur, as an investor, but I've also been involved in uh, a bunch of craters in the ground, uh, including some companies that looked like they were going to be very successful uh, and ended up. Uh, in the end failing and companies that looked like they were going to fail and in the end ended up being very successful. So, you know, over the last, um, you know, really uh, uh, closing in on 35 plus years, uh, I've had the journey as an entrepreneur, an angel investor uh, and a VC uh, that in today, in the moment that we're in today, where you know, we've been through a very, very strong, positive entrepreneurial experience for the last decade, which really, if you go back a dozen years, was nowhere to be seen. And if you go back even 15 years, when we started Techstars, the entrepreneurial environment uh, was very much on its back, was not uh, very healthy. Web 2.0 was just starting. Mobile was just starting to be a thing. Uh, but the sort of general statement that many people made was if you were serious about being an entrepreneur, you should just move to the Bay Area because that's the only place that companies get created, uh, which I always thought was nonsense and was very, very different than my own experience. I lived in, uh, grew up in Dallas, Texas. I lived in Boston for a dozen years. I spent a lot of time in Boston, New York. I spent a lot of time in Seattle and L.A., uh, I, when I started investing, even as an angel investor in the mid-90s, I was investing all across the U.S., uh, and I moved to Colorado in 1995 and have been based out of here uh, since then, but invested all around the U.S. And I had this very, very strong, uh, deeply held belief that you can start great companies anywhere in the world. And that, in fact, every city of any substance in the world needed a startup community to be part of it, not the center of it, but part of it to kind of keep the energy and the innovation dynamics and characteristics of the city uh, moving forward. So that's been a big part of my own 
uh, sort of intellectual and emotional focus as an investor. And, and frankly, one of the reasons why Techstars uh, came to be uh, when David, David, uh, Jared and I started talking about it, we're like, well, you know, let's try it in Boulder where there's plenty of stuff going on. And worst case is we make some new friends. And we didn't really have a broad aspiration of where it was going to go other than this hypothesis that we should be able to create a bunch of interesting companies uh, in Boulder, which is only 100,000 people. It's a small town. Um, our neighbor, Denver, which is, you know, 30 minutes away and about 2 million people at the time, there was not a lot of entrepreneurial activity going on to there as well. And for probably five or six years, the entrepreneurial activity in Boulder, 5% of the size or 120 of the size of Denver was much, much greater than the entrepreneurial activity in Denver. Today, Denver has a huge amount of entrepreneurial activity and is, you know, well recognized as uh, a very large city doing that. But, you know, sort of through all of these experiences, the time frames that I'm talking about, right? 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, we had this thing called the global financial crisis where, you know, all banks were going to be nationalized all around the world and, uh, you know, everything was going to collapse and we had this huge economic stress globally. Go back to the first venture firm I was part of, uh, lived through the internet bubble. Um, we had started in 1997, had a great experience between 1997 and 2000, and then 2001, 2002 got decimated um, by the collapse of the internet bubble. But a number of the companies in our funds and from that ended up becoming very successful uh, 2003, 2004, 2005. So, you know, as we find ourselves again in this moment of adjustment where there's a huge amount of volatility, um, not just in entrepreneurship, but, but around the world globally in terms of all aspects of our experience in big companies, uh, in societies, there's obviously, you know, a, a ground war going on uh, in, uh, in Russia and Ukraine right now, which two or three years ago would have been sort of something I don't think people would have necessarily processed. At a geopolitical level, the dynamics between the U.S., uh, Russia, and China uh, are also fascinating in terms of how they're starting to impact things like global supply chains and manufacturing and production and consumption of goods. And all of these things roll all the way through uh, to the entrepreneurial experience, even if you can't uh, uh, engage with them in a direct way. And I'll sort of end this rant from my frame of reference. These are all things that amplify and magnify the importance of entrepreneurship globally, not diminish it. And so this moment in time is a really important one for entrepreneurship. Um, and at the same time, is very, very challenging in lots of different ways because of all of the both structural and financial stresses that we face, um, you know, as entrepreneurs, as investors and in the macro environment. So, so that's that's a perfect segue into the the first questions. That is really the the purpose of of this conversation you and I were having, which is like you describe what is a pretty substantial turmoil on all fronts from all around the world, uh, with entrepreneurs everywhere trying to figure out how, how to manage that. We've we've at TechStars we've talked uh, to our portfolio company and 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 we talked to them a lot about okay. You need to preserve cash. You need to focus on, on revenues and profitability more than, than growth. You need to make sure that you don't uh, you don't underestimate the time that it takes to raise capital because it used to be you could raise really fast. And now it's it's definitely not the case and it's probably going to get worse. You need to act quickly, but you need to be responsive at the same time, et cetera, et cetera. So there's been a bunch of advices that have been just take a given to entrepreneurs for the last few months. When when you think about, given your experience, you, you've seen a quite a lot. Like, what are the, the key things that you say you think an entrepreneur right now trying to survive and to make sure that their business is still around at the end of this crisis? Like, what are the things that you think they should be focusing on? One of the challenges I think for an entrepreneur today is that there's an enormous amount of uh, advice that comes at you, much of which I would categorize as uh, cliches. And some of the cliches are quite good, but many of them are not that helpful. The reason they become cliches is that you have a few deep thinkers uh, within the entrepreneurial landscape and within the venture landscape. But I would underscore the word few, because what happens is that 
most people, whether they're VCs, and uh, I think a lot of the VCs in the world prognosticate, you know, what you should do, young entrepreneur, or, you know, I'm the VC, I'm going to tell you what you should do now, entrepreneur, is they amplify or repeat what other people are saying rather than doing really deep thinking in the context of the particular company that you're dealing with. So an example of it is um, you need to, uh, an example of a cliche would be you, you need to make sure you've got 36 months of cash. And the cliche gets labeled different ways. And I think the phrase that sort of has made the rounds the most is this notion of being default alive. And um, for some companies based on how much money they raised and what their growth rate is and what their dynamics are, that's pretty straightforward to do. And for many other companies, extremely hard to do. Um, and the idea of being uh, 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 alive 36 months from now, if you've got no customers and you've just spent 36 months of money and you've made no progress in your business, like why did you spend the 36 months doing that? Um, there's a great post, I, I, I uh, retweeted it or I tweeted it on my uh, uh, Twitter at Befeld this morning from Hunter Walk, which challenges some of the fundamental cliches. And the thing that I would start with in terms of advice is the generic advice is useful. It's useful to take it in and to process it and then to look at your specific situation and with the advisors that you think are deep thinkers, whether they're mentors or whether they're investors or whether they're just peers, try to understand what you should be doing in the context of your own business. So here would be, you know, here'd be a, a sort of more nuanced version of the make sure you have 36 months of cash. It's really hard to raise money right now. It's possible you can raise money. It's hard. It takes longer. Um, the prices are not anywhere near as interesting as they were uh, from an entrepreneur perspective uh, uh, 12 months ago. From an investor perspective, the prices are much better because you can invest at much lower valuations uh, for the equivalent business. Um, if you are in a position where you don't have to raise money in 2023, which is to say that you have a relatively easy way to have at least 18, but really 24 months of cash because not even start raising money until the beginning of 2024, put yourself in that position. Um, if that's really hard, in other words, you have four months of cash left or six months of cash left, and you can get your burn rate down, but getting your burn rate down to the place where it extends out to that means that you're not only not going to have any growth, but you're going to go backwards in your business. There's a whole series of different things you should do, including go to your existing investors right now and say to your existing investors, what capacity do you have for funding us right now? What kind of deal can we do that gives us more runway so we're not dependent on somebody else's capital in the near term? Again, nuanced based on if your answer is, I have no investors. OK, that's not an opportunity for you. But if you have investors who are planning on putting more capital in your company in the future, there's a conversation to have around that. So that would be just an example. There's probably 20 things like this that have all of a sudden become, uh, uh, again, I'm going to say cliches, that it's useful to apply them specifically to your business and your context. And so just to continue on that on that topic of cash preservation or, or creating cash reserve as we're all figuring out what's happening, how do you... How do you advise leaders to even assess their cash needs? Because right now, projecting revenue, sales, including inflation, it's its like, it's frankly, it's a crystal ball exercise in many, many cases. And yet you're being asked as a CEO, as an entrepreneur to figure out like, how do I get my company to survive the next 12 to 24 months? Do you have any, any specific advice that you give to them Absolutely. in terms of yeah. how they should be doing and, that? Yeah. Absolutely. And here's some specifics. First is whatever plan you're operating under that you put in place for your 22 operating plan, just get rid of it. It's just not right. And replan for the second half of the year. And I actually have most of the companies I'm an investor in now are on a 12 month rolling plan every quarter. So instead of having a 12 month plan and then at the end of the year, scrambling and doing a budget process and doing the next 12 months, they have a 12 month plan and every quarter they replan quarter plus one 
based on what just happened. So if we're in, you know, we just finished Q2, the plans that are being put together for Q3, Q4, Q2, Q1 of 23 and Q2 of 23. So it's a 12 month rolling. And your first quarter, your Q3 quarter, which should be based off of what just happened in Q2 and what your previous Q3 quarter was, has a lot more adjustment based on what your current reality is. And most of that adjustment is a more realistic view of what your top line is going to be based on what just happened and what your pipeline is and what your sales forecast and what's going on in your market versus what you thought in December of 2021, which is just wrong. It's obsolete. The second part of that that's so powerful, though, is that the big thing that you can adjust is your cost structure, especially the investments you were planning on making. And so in December of 2021, you were planning in Q3, you were going to hire all these people and you'd have all this growth and all these things would be happening. And you're now having to deal with a very different reality for Q3. Instead of having a nonsense number for Q4, you can adjust what you think Q4, Q1, and Q2 of next year, not with a super detailed planning process, but with the calibration of what's going on. So it's recognize that your time horizon for planning, especially on what you're investing in and what you're spending extra money in has compressed. The second part of it is understanding your economic dynamics much better. Vast majority of companies two years ago, even last year, were focused on top line revenue growth, independent of what it meant from a cost structure capital valued revenue growth. So as long as your revenue is growing 100% or more year over year, you get a crazy valuation no matter what kind of, you know, things are going on in the rest of your company. And, you know, VCs would talk about unit economics and occasionally it would come up. But generally speaking, as long as you were growing, it didn't matter what those underlying economics were. That's the wrong order in this environment. Revenue is not the top of the list. Interestingly, the top of the list from my frame of reference right now is gross margin and understanding what your true gross margin dollars are, because those are the dollars that you can actually spend on your business. And there's a very big difference in the dynamics between a business that has a gross margin of 80 percent and a business that has a gross margin of 30 percent. To translate it simply, you know, if you're a 10 million dollar business, and you've got an 80% gross margin, it means, you know, after you sell something, you get to keep 8 million of that. And that's what you have to run your business. If you're a 30% gross margin company, you're only keeping 3 million. So there's a big difference of what you actually have to spend on the rest of your business. The second number is contribution margin, which almost no one talks about, but it's your gross margin minus your cost of selling not your cost of sales, not producing the product, but your cost of actually selling to the customer. In venture land, it gets talked about as CAC, customer acquisition costs. You have this language around LTV. And it sort of works for a SaaS company. doesn't work that well for any company that's not a B2B SaaS company. So you have to actually then take, what did it cost me to sell this 80 cents that I get to keep of every dollar or 30 cents of every dollar. And that number then is the amount of money that you have to invest in people, infrastructure, and the future activity of the business. So you take your cash number and instead of saying, okay, I've got this much cash, here's my monthly burn rate, and here's what my revenue ramp's going to be, and here's when I run out of money. You deconstruct it the next level down and say, okay, what's my actual gross margin? What am I really getting to keep? What's it costing me to sell stuff? Is my selling motion efficient? Am I wasting a bunch of money because I'm trying to get sales that if I didn't spend that money on the salespeople or the Google and Facebook ads that are no longer performing the way they were before, uh, it, 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 you know, where can I make sure I maximize with the growth aspiration that I have, that contribution margin. And then go to a mode below that in terms of spend, which is very aligned with, by the way, how things used to work and sort of worked outside of the internet bubble. So you have to take the internet bubble year out, bubble years out because that happened then. 
but it's for the size business you have, size your monthly burn and say, we're going to run this business at this maximum burn rate. Depending on what stage you're at, if you're very early stage, maybe it's a $50,000 a month maximum burn. Uh, if it's a you know, mid-stage business, maybe a two fifty dollars or $500,000 a month maximum burn. If you are got a significant amount of growth and you've got meaningful cash in the bank, maybe it's a higher number. I was talking to an entrepreneur the other day, and you know, they were saying, I, I, everybody's telling me I have to be cash flow positive now, no matter what. I said, well, if you have $200 million in the bank, do you have to be cash flow positive? Uh, what do you mean? I said, well, if you have $200 million in the bank and you lost a million dollars a quarter cash flow, how many quarters do you have? 200. So 200 quarters enough? Like, you know, do you need to have 200 quarters in front of you? So it's very much situational specific, but then it gets to the important next number which is your actual cash flow, which you know should be called cash burn, but often gets conflated with numbers like EBITDA. And depending on the type of business you are, your, your monthly cash flow could be very, very divergent from what your monthly EBITDA is. If they're very similar, that's great. But if they're divergent based on how you collect money, how you have to spend money to buy things, what your contract terms look like if you sell on contract terms, how you recognize revenue if you sell a physical product. So you're now a hardware company, so you have to manufacture the product and have inventory and really understanding how to navigate and manage the cash flow. Because a lot of companies in this kind of environment that haven't had that sort of discipline of looking at those numbers say, all right, I've got $10 million in the bank. My EBITDA is half a million dollars a month. I'm good for 20, a uh, negative half a million dollars a month. I'm good for 20 months. I'm good. Except for your cash flow because of your inventory needs based on what you have to build and what you're selling causes your cash flow to be minus a million and a half a month, which is only six months. And by the way, what you're finding is that you're not selling as much because of the macro environment. So now you're building up some inventory. That's good because eventually you'll be able to sell that inventory. But how much inventory you're willing to build up because you have to pay for that inventory and the cash is not coming in for that. All of a sudden, your cash burn in a month is three million dollars. And that ten million dollars only lasts you three months. So like understanding how to manage your financial characteristics from a cash flow perspective versus a grow at any cost. Hey, how much did you grow last month? You know, are we growing at that pace? Using that and then tying it back to the first thing I said, which is narrowing the scope of your planning, recognizing that there's so much stuff changing that you don't have control over, that having a tighter planning cycle, not the same heavy weight. Like if you had to go through a budget cycle that you do at the end of the year for a medium sized business, Every quarter, you'll blow your brains out. That's misery. But you can certainly make adjustments as a leadership team on a quarterly basis, have a plan of record. But within that adjustment, if you're looking out 12 months, you have some situational awareness that has enough visibility into the future. And in some ways, it'll make you a much more durable business. And it's true even if you're a very small company with four people and very little revenue because you build the muscle of that kind of planning now. And in a situation where things adjust and capital becomes more available, it turns out we don't have a recession in 2023, you know, which I think a lot of economists would say it's 50-50, whether there's a recession or not. The war uh, you know, in Ukraine resolves, some supply chain issues loosen up, interest rates start drifting back down. Like there's all of these things that you have absolutely no control over. And anyone who predicts when they're going to happen is full of shit. They don't have any idea. And so you have to run your business with that uncertainty. And you have to be flexible enough so that you can adjust. And so we, we actually we're starting to have some 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 questions. And one of them, as you explained that basically you have to to run your business differently depending on the the cash flow situation that you have one of the question that we got was for 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 companies who just closed around before the markets tighten um 
how do they need to think about investing in growth uh, versus being conservative with burn? And, and it's a good problem to have, just to be clear. That's an excellent problem to have because yep. my next question is going to be about the companies who didn't raise and are now thinking about doing down round and should they be doing down round? But let's start with the positive. Yeah, so you just raise money. It depends on how much money you raised and how long you thought that money was going to last you and what your investors' expectations are. But the very first thing I do if you you know recently loaded up uh, with a bunch of cash, I would do two things. Um, one, I would talk uh, directly to my board and my investors uh, and get calibration expectation because one of the thing with them, one of the things that the investor can't do, let's say that the investor put you just raised, uh, I'll pick uh, biggish biggish kind of numbers. Let's say you just raised uh, twenty five medium sized numbers, twenty five million dollars at a two hundred million dollar valuation. And your business last in, in uh, 2021, uh, you got that on a valuation of 2021 revenue of 2 million growing to your 22 plan was to grow to 8 million. And you say, well, that's ludicrous. Why would anybody pay 100 times revenue uh, for a business? And the answer was six months ago or nine months ago, people were paying 100 times <coughs> current revenue because they were looking at paying, they were kind of paying 20 or 25 times the next year. You got $20 million in the bank. That financing happened relatively recently. It didn't happen yesterday. It happened nine months ago, right? Or six months ago or four months ago, you spent some of that money. What do you have today? Your growth rate is probably not on track. Maybe it is. Maybe you're growing from 2 million to eight, but a lot of companies that had that kind of growth rate trajectory. You're growing from two and now you're saying, eh, maybe it's going to be five and a half. Maybe it's going to be six. Step one, calibrate with your existing investors in terms of what their view of the world is. Because the thing they can't do is they can't go to you right now and say, I don't want that $200 million valuation anymore. I paid too much for your company. I want to get a better price. I want you to lower the price um, because I want to feel better. Tough. They, they can't do that. So the tool that they have though, is if you run out of money, they can come and say, hey, you need more money. I'll do it at a lower price, right? Down round. And so getting calibrated between the expectations of what growth you have to have to get to a valuation that's equal to or better than where your valuation was and making sure everyone around the table has the same viewpoint of that is key. A lot of the, these companies, when they raise money, they expected that the money that they raised, 20, 20 $25 million dollars, you know, financings were happening so quickly. In six months, you're going to raise more money at double the valuation because you're going to have this crazy growth rate. And the market's going to say, oh, you're going from two to eight. And now you're going to go from eight to 30. And so somebody's going to come in in 30 in 2024. And they're going to say, well, I'll pay 20 times that. So I'll give you a $600 million valuation now for more money. That's gone. That might come back, but it's gone. And so the idea that, you have to now have enough time to make enough progress to show that your business is working, especially against the backdrop of it getting harder. So if you thought you're going from two to eight and now you're halfway through the year and you're really going to go to two to two, five and a half, there's no way that your next year plan is going to be eight to 30. And there's no way you're going to go from five and a half to 30. And it's probably more likely you're going to go from five and a half to 10 or 12, or maybe if you're doing really well, 15, that's the conversation to have and sort of the look forward conversation. And by the way, most of those investors didn't invest just based on your 2021 or 2022 numbers. They, you probably gave them a 2023 number and maybe there was an extrapolation to a 2024 number. So that's the open conversation. Second, Sorry. Sorry. second thing, just as important, if you haven't raised venture debt, to add venture debt to your balance sheet right now, um, you should go do that tomorrow. And there continues to be a lot of interest by venture debt lenders to uh, add. Brad, maybe you could explain what venture debt sure. is. Venture debt is debt that gets lent to you by banks like Silicon Valley Bank, JP Morgan, Signature Bank. And it's banks, uh, those banks loan you money based on the idea of. <clears throat> what they call a primary source of repayment. 
And the primary source of repayment for them generally is that there's going to be another financing. So they're not lending to you like a traditional bank where a traditional bank is lending based on your EBITDA, but they're based on, they're lending based on the strength of your existing investors and the strength of your existing business and the reputations of your existing investor and the strength of your existing business. And that, that is a, a become a very large market. It is tricky to get venture debt the right way because the venture lenders, you know, here's a cliche and you'll hear this from a lot of VCs, the venture lenders lend you money that you can't actually use. The only money you have access to uh, is um, money, you know, money that they haven't lent you. By the time you get to using their money, uh, you don't have access to it. That turns out not to be correct. That turns out to be a function of a lot of people in the cycle not understanding how to work with venture debt lenders to get deals so that you actually have access to that capital. But that capital, when you have a lot of money in the bank, is relatively easy to get. When you don't have a lot of capital in the bank, you can't get it. So uh, in the book I wrote, Venture Deals, um, there's a very ex detailed explanation of this in Chapter 11. Um, we named it Chapter 11 on purpose for those of you that know bankruptcy law. Um, one of the challenges, um, you know, with running out of money is that one of your choices to go bankrupt. And one of the challenges with that is that you're taking on money you have to pay back versus equity, which you don't. But those would be the two things that I would, I would encourage people. One, just really get recalibrated with your existing investors and the board. Don't hide behind valuations of the future, but make sure everybody's playing the same game. Because if they're not, and you don't know what your investors are trying to do, uh, or want to do with where you're at, that's that's a big miss. And then, you know, the second is, and by the way, it's not just venture debt. It's also, if your existing investors want to put additional money in your company right now, even at a valuation that might not be as attractive as the one they just did, it's worth a conversation to at least talk about and understand where it's at. Again, if you've raised a ton of money, that that's nonsense. But if you've only raised, you know, three, $4 million, and that's not going to last you as long as you'd like it to last now, given the environment, have that conversation. Got it. So let, let's talk actually about funding availability, because the, the reality is that most uh, most companies, most entrepreneurs right now are more worried about, Am I do I need to do a down round? Am I even going to be able to raise money? Can, can you talk a little bit about funding availability, uh, anything that you've seen happening, especially at the uh, really early stage? So pre-revenue, pre-seed, like, like really, really early stage. Yeah, well, and I think it's worth separating, right? At the very early stages, you your existing investors are probably um, either uh, individuals, angels, friends, and family, or they you might as you know have have a, a pre seed or seed stage VC firm as an early investor. Now it turns out, uh, and just one comment uh, on the uh, I see in the chat, venture debt will often require founders to shift their entire banking operations that a hundred percent of the time. So that's that's part of the deal. Uh, with that. And there's some benefits to that. And there's some risks to that. So you just have to understand that dynamic. Um, if you're, if you're a pre-seed or seed stage company, there isn't a ton of pre-seed and seed stage money available from institutional investors. I think in the last couple of years, there's several, just in the U S there's several thousand seed and pre-seed funds that were raised in 2020 and 2021 that have capital that they're deploying. The interesting thing is it's going to be harder for them to raise money in 2022 and 2023, especially as the high net worth individuals who were some of their LPs just got, you know, creamed in the market. So they might feel less high net worth. Most of those funds are investing over time. So they're consuming capital from their investors versus sending capital back. So the, the pool of people that are high net worth investing in those funds is decreasing, but also the institutional focus on those funds uh, is decreased for a bunch of reasons. However, right now, around the world, there are lots of those funds with plenty of capital. So at the pre-seed and seed stage level, putting real effort into finding a partner or an investor who is going to help you, not just with some dollars, not just with some, 
you know, support, operational expertise, mentorship, but that has the capability to attract other investors in the Series A is very valuable. About even a year ago, that was not as important because there was so much money chasing the deals that were coming out of pre-seed and seed that you know, was, there was less discrimination on who your investor was at the pre-seed or seed stage level. So I'd work harder, by the way, not just to get one, but to get a syndicate of investors at the pre-seed and seed stage level. So the network that you have when you need to raise your Series A is stronger. But there's a lot of capital there. And so the entrepreneurs who say, I can't get my seed stage round done or my pre-seed stage round done, in today's right now, even in today's market, it's not a market phenomenon. It's a fact that you're having trouble raising money because you're either not in a network that is giving you access to investors or there's something wrong with your company or your pitch or how you're approaching it. One thing that has changed that I would uh, I'll use an example. There was a, a cycle of of pre seed and seed stage investing, I think, that hit a fevered pitch last summer where the advice was assume the deal is done before you start fundraising. Decide how much you're going to raise, go out very aggressively to a bunch of seed stage investors and basically say, we're closing around on uh, it's July 14th. We're closing around on August 14th. Are you in or are you out? Here's my pitch deck. And it was much less effort into actually building a relationship with the investor and much more of trying to drive some version of fear of missing out or show that you have all this momentum with your fundraising already. And so they don't just don't have much time to get a deal done. That that really hit a fevered pitch last summer. And we have a lot of investors in we're, we're investors in as foundry 47 um, pre seed and seed stage companies and you know, it was just like the volume and the noise was so high. That's changed where there's not as much fear of missing out. I think people are like, you know, I need to actually get higher quality investments. So building that relationship is important. Tail end of this. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I was going to say tail end of this piece. This is seed and pre-seed. Once you get to series A, there's still plenty of series A money available, but it's become much more uh, discriminating in a very, very short period of time. And as you get to series B and later, um, same thing, much more discriminating. And late stage, much of the extremely fast checks, momentum-based investing at very high pricing has gone to the sidelines again. And there's lots of articles about this, but the, you know, the articles about SoftBank and Tiger and KOTU and others who are either investing earlier, whether that's really true or not, time will tell, um, or just kind of said, you know, we're... We're on the sidelines. Yeah, we'll make some investments, but it's got to be really high quality versus a phone call and a check, you know, which was happening in the summer of last year. So recognize that that the stage matters a lot. But my my strong advice for anyone at any stage is invest in building time, a relationship with investors who can help you with your capital formation going forward versus just investors who are throwing money around or Again, right now, there aren't that many investors who are just throwing money around. So you have to put the energy into building those relationships. That, that, that makes sense. And by the way, in my own experience as the CEO of multiple company, some of which had to go through pretty intense restructuring and, and economic crisis, the relationship with uh, the board, which were mainly like investors, uh, as well as other investors on the cap table, have proven every single time to be absolutely critical. So I could not uh, emphasize enough what Brad just said, which is like the relationships are built in the long term. Uh, it used to be, as you say, that people will give you money based on a two days due diligence. It's not the case anymore. And the more you have built this relationship over time, people understand your business. They know you, the easier, the easier it is. Having said that, and that was one of the, the question also that, that one of the participants asked, um, a lot of pre-seed founders uh, feel like they're stuck in this chicken and egg situation where they need funding to get traction, but then the investors tell them that they're not going to give them money until they have traction. And so it's like, how do I prove that I have traction without money, basically? 
Um, do you have any advice on how to get out of this chicken and egg situation of money, traction, traction, money? Yeah, it, it's one of the hardest parts of the very beginning of the fundraising cycle. And um, one of the things that I've seen over you know, a long period of time, 30 plus years, is the definitions change constantly. So, you know, the cliche is the goalposts are always changing, right? And it's just true. It's like when the, uh, when the markets, supply demand characteristics in the market are a certain way, the definition of traction is much smaller, right? When there's a ton of capital chasing, you know, the, a, a scarce number of deals, uh, you don't need much traction. When that changes and the capital either slows down its investing or there's less capital, and this is particularly true, I think, in a lot of geographies where there isn't as much capital in that geography. And one of the things that has happened, you know, that I think COVID accelerated was the geographic mobility of capital. So investors being willing to invest in lots of different places. But when, you know, the markets tighten like they just have, that geographic mobility tightens, right? So the definition of traction increases. In today's market, it's what's relevant, not yesterday's market. In today's market, the key is to show real demonstrable progress on vectors that your potential investors are looking for on a continuous basis. And so there's two parts to that. One is you have to understand what traction means to the investors you're talking to. If you're engaged with an investor uh, and they say, I'm really interested in what you're doing, but you need to show more traction. And you ask them, OK, can you know that I totally get it. Can you explain to me what traction means to you just so I understand? And what you get back is the Charlie Brown, wah, 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 like it doesn't mean anything to you. Then really, it's, they're full of shit. They're, they're, they're just trying to use that as a way to say, I don't want to invest in you without saying, I don't want to invest in you. If they come back and say, all right, for your business, if you can show me that A, B, and C can happen, that's when I'm going to be interested. That's really useful to you. The problem is that you're going to get different A, Bs, and Cs from each investor, right? So it's not a consistent traction means you have to do this. But at least you have a roadmap, hopefully from more than one, maybe five, maybe 10 pre-seed investors or seed investors or, you know, people who can write checks as angels who are giving you from their frame of reference, the landscape to follow. And then the key for you is to do two things. One, really understand what those are. It's, it's write them down. It's don't just like let them be vague rah, rah, rah kind of things, but define them, figure out which ones of those with the limited resources you have, you can actually start executing against. You don't have to execute against all of the feedback you get, but you've got to say, okay, I have 10 data points of this is the first thing we have to do. Five of them, there's no way we can do those things. But these five, we can. Once you get a set of investors who start to become interested in you, that actually is traction in the definition of the other investors, even if you didn't do the specific things that they laid out. Last comment on this, you're not going to get definitive data. You're not going to get people giving you tons of information, lots of roadmap. This is where critical thinking has to come from on your part, which is you have to say, all right, I got three people. Uh, you know, we have, you know, no real customers yet. And I just heard from everybody that they want to see, uh, they want to see traction equals customers. I have a bunch of people who I could use as alpha testers for my product. My product's not ready to be sold. I'm not going to get people to buy it, but I'm going to be able to get people to use it and give me feedback. It doesn't cost me anything to get it in their hands other than, you know, just some effort and some muscle. Hmm. Let me set up a free alpha test or a free beta test for those customers. Let me get every week a new person in that beta test program. So I'm not trying to get a whole bunch of people in it, but each week I'm trying to add somebody new to it. And after a month or two, maybe the answer is two a week. After two months, I've got 
10 or 20 people using it, half of them drop out, but I've got five to 10 really active users and I'm getting real feedback from them in a way that I can show that feedback to the VC that said, you need to have some customers. Because what, what that question, if you decode it, it means it's not revenue. You need to show me $100,000 a month of revenue. A VC might tell you that. By the way, if a VC says you need to be at $100,000 a month of revenue, they're not a pre-seed VC and they're probably not a seed VC. They just disqualified themselves from your stage, right? But if somebody says, I need to see customers, bringing them actively engaged beta users is, is powerful. I'm describing a particular type of business, right? I mean, you might be a B2C company. The, 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 the dynamics might be many, many more users than what I'm describing, but try to figure out sort of how to get in a flow so all of a sudden you're delivering something on that path. Again, tight time frame, you know, weeks, not months or quarters. Um, and then build a feedback loop with those potential investors uh, and over communicate with them what's going on versus under communicate, especially if they engage and are willing to help. So we've talked about cash management. Then we talked about how to improve it with debt. We talked about how to improve it with fundraising, potentially with down round. We've, we, we, we talk about different aspects of that. One thing that we haven't talked about yet is exit strategy. And um, is it even still an option? Uh, some participants were saying that there is some M&A activity uh, in, in some vertical with a lot of vertical integration. Um, how, how do you think entrepreneurs should be looking at M&A as an exit strategy these days? Is it, is it even relevant? Yeah. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, let me make one comment on down rounds really quickly. Um, I, I don't think anybody should be afraid of a down round. For some reason, the whole notion of a down round has become this fearful thing. Um, and, uh, you know, the history of, of, of fundraising and of, raising money for companies is that there's lots of different price points at which money gets raised. And even if you look in the public markets, right? I mean, companies raise money at lots of different valuations, including valuations that are lower than a previous valuation that they raise money and people buy and sell stocks at different valuations. So I don't know why the down round became such a toxic construct and such a thing that people are so fearful of. No, it's, it's not as good as having an up round. Um, I heard somebody say, well, once you have a down round, you're dead. Like, no, I mean, people gave you money and, you know, you're the opposite of dead. You got you got a chance to kind of keep going. Um, and so I would just try to change the language around it and just be more realistic about the idea that, you know, we're in a cycle where people raised money at very high valuations and future financings in a lot of cases are going to be at lower prices uh, than the last round that was raised. And being really clear about your capital structure, especially as your companies get um, more mature, is important. You can, you can artificially inflate valuation by giving your new investor a whole bunch of features uh, with their financing that in the exit causes them to get a disproportionate amount of the outcome, especially in a medium case, than what they would have gotten if you just priced the company at a lower price. Um, in terms of exits, one of the things that I think has been challenging uh, in the market the last couple of years is that um, uh, for many buyers of companies, things got too expensive. And this is true in the world of private equity uh, and private equity sponsored companies that you know were very active acquirers of B2B SaaS companies at prices, depending on your growth rate, that ranged from a couple of times revenue, two, three times revenue to 10 times revenue. Um, and for many of those buyers, they were like, yeah, when somebody is at 25 times revenue, not, not, not interested, like that's not going to happen. Um, now that prices have adjusted so much, I think there's going to be a lot more interest uh, from that universe of buyers in, in consolidating their segments and buying companies. So that's piece number one. Um, second, you have a lot of well-funded companies. I mean, a lot of companies in the last two years raised, uh, private companies raised hundreds of millions of dollars. And if you have a company like that in your market segment, um, you know, you're adjacent to them all of a sudden, um, they're going to use some of that capital. Some of those companies are going to use some of that capital to grow in organically through acquisition um, because they're not able to get the growth that they want 
uh, in a you know, in a market where there's inflation and where people are being more careful about what they're spending money on and where there's a withdrawal of corporate spending because in the 2022, or sorry, 2023 budget cycle, everybody's going to cut their spending because da 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 all this sort of thing. So you're again in this sort of interesting situation as a young to medium-sized company where the buyer universe increases. Um, and then the last is, and, and it, I've seen it in every single cycle that I've been in, involved in going back to uh, the, the, uh, the late 80s, my first company was bought by a company that bought 40 companies in three years and consolidated a market segment. And we weren't looking to sell our company. I didn't have any idea even how to sell a company. It wasn't a construct that was on my mind. I woke up each morning and I thought about how to make more money than I lost each day because we didn't have any capital and we had to build our business. And then out of the blue, there was a company that found us very interesting to add on to what they were doing as they bought a bunch of co companies in consolidating a particular market uh, category. So there will be a lot of those companies that, or at least a number of those companies that, that, that get emerged and get funded. It's also worth um, recognizing whether your business is really a disruptive business or not, and you're just kind of bullshitting yourself, right? Are you number... 20 in a category where there's 19 other venture backed companies doing a something similar, or are you number one or number two in a category, or are you creating a really totally new category? If you're number 20 in a category, um, you might or might not be able to sell your company. If you're in the other case where you're really a market leader or one of the market leaders, or you are truly creating a new category, um, many of the larger cap companies are going to be looking for sizable acquisitions because prices are now much more reasonable for them to do something about. So I would absolutely use it as a strategy. The key thing is if you're trying to sell your company when you have no money in the bank, it, it sucks, right? If you have three months or six months of runway and you're trying to sell your company, it's really hard to sell your company because Number one, it takes a couple of months to get a deal done. And number two, any buyers that are looking at you sort of don't recognize that time is not your friend. So figuring out how to put yourself in a position if you're really going to sell your company so you're not out of time is powerful. And, you know, I'll give an example. There are many, I don't know the number. I'm going to guess that there's thousands, but I'm, it's, a, it's a guess. Thousands of B2B SaaS businesses that do between half a million a month and two million a month in uh, MRR. So they're, you know, 10, uh, let's say five to $20 million companies that are not growing very quickly, growing somewhere between 0% and 10%, 20%. Those companies are not worth very much. And it's very hard to buy those companies, uh, especially, or sell those companies, especially if they're losing money. But if they're break even, they're actually quite valuable or if they're generating positive cash flow, they're quite valuable because they often have a critical mass of customer base. They might have unique technology. They might have some market differentiation. And they have, if they're making money, they have theoretically infinite runway. So they can hang out for a while as they slowly build their business. Um, and so the ability for somebody to see a company like that and say, that adds to our business. You know, the difference between making, you know, $25,000 a month every month and losing $250,000 a month every month if you're one of those companies is really profound in the M&A cycle. Um, if you have, you know, experienced investors that have done lots of transactions, they'll know, they'll know what those dynamics are. Um, and, and listen, because a lot of entrepreneurs sort of live their life thinking, well, like if I can just, let's just a couple more months and we'll get the growth running again. But if you've been six months or 12 months and you haven't been able to get the growth running again, with the money that you're spending, maybe deal with the reality of it and readjust your business so that you're making a little bit of money every month. So jumping to something that you've just said around down round, um, there was a, a question uh, around 490 valuation. And there's been a lot of talk of larger tech companies uh, reevaluating their 490 valuations. And, and so uh, some, some people were wondering whether earlier stage companies, so series A, B, or potentially even earlier, should think about this too. And I think that goes really well hand in hand with the conversation around the down round that we were having. Yeah, so this is um, 
the, just just to sort of un, unroll this, the four uh, the four hundred nine A valuation is what's used to price stock options, and um, I, I need to get some history on this. It, it, I, the four hundred nine A rules came into effect, I think, around two thousand and thirteen or twelve. Prior to that. I should know exactly because I wrote a whole bunch of blog posts about it because it was so stupid. Um, prior to that, the way that you priced options was as long as you weren't on a path to going public, you could generally get away with a price that was 10 to 20 percent the preferred price. And the whole structure of the, for, the, of the option pricing was to get options into employees' hands at the lowest possible strike price. It had nothing really to do with the actual valuation of the company. But instead of giving employees shares of stock, which had a tax implication, you give them an option, which didn't have a tax implication. They didn't have to, for the employee, they didn't have to pay tax. You give them a share of stock, they had to pay some tax. You give them an option, they don't have to pay tax at the time that you give them an option. So the goal was to have the lowest strike price you could have. 409A, for whatever reason, created a whole uh, industry uh, because, you know, the the accounting regulatory uh, environments, which in the U.S. are uh, entertaining to talk about what their uh, what their roles are, AICPA is the phrase that uh, people people should know. Decided that um, the 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 process that uh, private companies were using wasn't valid, and uh, as a result, there was a whole bunch of regulatory activity that ended up creating the 409A code uh, in the IRS code. Um, the 409A process is a much more rigorous process than what was before, which was, hey, should we be 10% or 20% to preferred? Now it's actually, there's some work that goes into it. And for early stage companies, though, it still translates into a discount that's about 80% from the preferred price. So, so you know, that that's what happens at the early stages. But as companies get to series A, series B, series C, it drifts up. So now maybe it's 33% to the preferred and now maybe it's 50% of the preferred by the time you get to the series B. So the benefit to the employees is not as good because their starting point, their strike price is much higher. If I was an employee of a company that raised money at a $200 million valuation, and they granted me uh, shares at a $100 million strike price equivalent, whatever the price per share was, I would be less excited than if they were able to grant me those shares at a $20 million strike price equivalent. And if you translate that into price per share, right, if the $200 million valuation, let's just say divide by 10, that's $20 a share, <clears throat> my options would be at $10 a share at a $100 million valuation. Uh, and at a uh, $20 million valuation, my options would be at $2 a share. So would I rather have options at $2 a share that are worth 20, $18 worth of spread, or would I rather have uh, options at $10 a share worth 20, $10 worth of spread? I'd much rather have the $18. All right, so that that's the backdrop. When the valuation, uh, you get an option, let's say it's a 50, 50%, so you've got your $10 option, the, 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 the price was 200, but the market's just gone down. So that $200 million valuation is no longer worth $200 million. Maybe that company really is worth 80 million. And so you have a ten a ten dollar strike price on a stock that might be worth eight dollars a share. If it was public markets, you'd never do that stock exercise. You'd wait until the price recovered. In the private markets, one of the things that you can do is you can reprice the options very easily. There's very little implication. It used to be a big implication. Today, it's not. And so a lot of times, companies you know they they, they do a new four hundred nine a. It turns out in the situation. Uh, that I'm describing, the 409A valuation is now, let's say, uh, you know, two or three dollars a share based on the new valuation. And the company can revalue your option instead of it being $10 strike price, it can now be a $2 strike price or a $3 strike price. Two things happen. The, it, it's a huge positive for the employee. Yeah, your value went down, but my entry point for ownership in the company just got a lot lower. That's a positive. Emotionally, a lot of employees are like, well, the value of the company went down. The company's not worth as much. And the thing to realize is that at a private company, it's probably not liquid. You probably can't sell your stock anyway, especially in an environment like this. 
So really you're betting on the future value build and don't you wanna get into that future value build at a lower price? So um, I would say in, my, in our portfolio, we've encouraged almost all of the companies that have either had a down round or when they have a 409A and they have a meaningfully lowering of that 409A to go through the process of changing the strike price for their existing employees to give the benefit of that lower strike price in the future to their existing employees. I know there was a lot to unpack in that, but I, I sort of put it in the context of as founders, uh, the notion that your 409A just went down uh, should be viewed by your employees as a good thing, not a bad thing, if you use it to reprice their options. If you don't do anything with it, then you know, it doesn't benefit them in any way. So we have been talking for over an hour. Uh, I wanted to squeeze two more questions uh, before, before we're going to let everybody go and you in particular. Uh, so the first question is around, um, advices that you would have for underrepresented founders, women, BIPOC trying to raise in this market. I mean, we all know that statistically it's, it's pretty hard, uh, for these groups, even in, in hot markets. And now that the markets are significantly cooler to say the least. Um, there's a lot of question about like, what do these underrepresented founders uh, need to do to, to still be able to, to raise? Do you have any advice? And then I have a, one last question before we, before we leave. Sure. Uh, you know, the, the, the direct statement is important just to, you know, acknowledge as truthful as it's much harder. Uh, and the, the percentage of capital that go to underrepresented founders is much smaller. Um, and a bunch of other things, right? The networks that those underrepresented founders have uh, are often different in terms of access to capital or experience with making these types of investments. Um, the geographies, uh, in a lot of cases, that the underrepresented uh, founders are in may have very different capital dynamics and historical capital dynamics around that. So, I mean, just acknowledging the reality of that, there's a lot of people who don't uh, uh, acknowledge the reality of it, and I think it's important to do. Second, um, the positive, and, and we've really seen this in the last two, two years, and, and at Foundry, we've participated in this significantly. Um, uh, we, um, uh, we've deliberately made investments in funds that are led by women and people of color. And uh, in our fund portfolio, if you, if, if you go to foundry.vc and look at the 47 partner funds that we, that, that we have, you'll see a number of funds that are focused on, uh, that are run by underrepresented VCs, right? Not traditional white male uh, uh, VC uh, uh, founders. And I don't mean just have like a, a junior partner on the team, but are actually run and led by. And a big part of their focus and their networks are investing in um, underrepresented founders. So I, I would say that at the early stages, especially, um, there there is more capital uh, being uh, managed by underrepresented VC, uh, uh, under VCs who, who are in underrepresented communities. And I think that's a big positive in terms of access to capital. Um, and I would view that as a, a focal point uh, for an, any entrepreneur who's underrepresented. Second, um, I think organizations, and I'll, I'll just call out Techstars, like there's a lot of work going on to try to make sure that the networks are global and more equitable, not equal, but more equitable. And in the context of those networks being more equitable, part of that is making them more accessible uh, to underrepresented founders and then amplifying those underrepresented founders in the networks that they're part of. So I, I try to encourage uh, all underrepresented founders to think hard about what networks they can attach to beyond their natural networks, which by the way, is no different than you know, what any entrepreneur does generally with the nuance that historically many of those, those networks have been self-referential, right? You know, if, if you're part of the MIT community uh, because you went to MIT, you have the benefit of that um, and that network becomes self-referential um, versus that network saying, you know what, I'm, I'm going to try to make sure I'm being inclusive of people who are not in my network but have other characteristics that uh, could benefit 
uh, from this network. I'm seeing more activity across those, just as an example of that, um, uh, through my foundation, Amy and I support uh, a series of women entrepreneurial programs at MIT. We do it at, at other places as well, but explicitly women's entrepreneurial leadership programs where part of the focus is not just within the MIT community, because they already get a lot of benefit within the MIT community, but outside the MIT community, linking them to other women's leadership networks that could also reflectively get benefit back the other direction. So, you know, there's, there's no magic trick from my perspective. I don't know a magic trick. I, 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 all I know is uh, working hard to find people who are willing to engage bi-directionally with you to give you access to their networks um, and people who are willing to uh, not just invest in you, um, but are really focused on this notion of uh, approaching underrepresented founders from a perspective of, uh, of equity uh, and putting energy into that. Last question. Who are the top three thought leaders you recommend people to follow? Other than you, obviously. <laughs> well, I mentioned Hunter Walk this morning. I think Hunter's blog is, uh, yeah. he, he, it's excellent. He, he is willing to say what's on his mind. Uh, he doesn't feel the need to, uh, to be like everybody else. Um, and so I, I think he's, he's an uh, outstanding uh, thinker. Um, a uh, super long-term friend of mine um, who is uh, another outstanding thinker here that's been through many, 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 many ups and downs uh, is Fred Wilson uh, from Union Square Ventures. And Fred writes a blog, ABC. But the interesting thing, even if he's not blogging every day, there's an enormous amount of useful stuff going back to 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007 um, on both of our blogs um, that are reflective of this moment of time because they were talking about entrepreneurship against the backdrop of a lot of challenges. Um, and so from that perspective, I put him high on the list. Another different, I'm going to do two more, Mile. Um, a, a different angle uh, is mental health uh, and your own sort of sense of self and the journey each individual entrepreneur goes through um, especially in really stressful times when everything's working and everything feels great. Like, you know, we, we're all humans. We're all big bags of chemicals. Like there's plenty of ups and downs, even when everything's going great. But when there's stresses and those stresses don't have to just be business. Uh, the organization that I think is the best at this for entrepreneurs is Reboot, uh, Reboot.io. And they have lots of content, but also a really outstanding podcast series that Jerry Colonna uh, who is the, one of the founders of Reboot does. And there's, again, even if they're not very frequent right, right now, there's tons of gems in their back catalog um, uh, that if you go back in time that you can really get um, things from. Last one, which is not an entrepreneurial thought leader, but I find him awesome, hilarious. And I talk about sort of the, the deep thinker or insightful thinker. Um, he is the most insightful writer I have seen on two topics. One is public markets and sort of what's going on in public markets. And the other is crypto and what's going on in crypto. And his name is Matt Levine or Levine. I don't know him, so I don't know how to say it. He writes for Bloomberg. It's L-E-V-I-N-E. -E. Unbelievable. And right now his, he, he writes three or four times a week, sometimes more. The only two things he can he has capacity to write about is is the absolute abject abject crypto meltdown and you know the Ponzi scheme that is a significant amount of what's going on in crypto. And he writes about it brilliantly and incisively and hilariously. And the other is the whole Twitter Elon Musk nonsense. The one and, this morning was so funny. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's it's humorous, but it is. He is, he is spot on. It's, it's when I talk about deep thinking, like you can read the surface level stuff on either of these two things from, from, you know, both from business writers, not just from CNN, but from real business writers. And you read it and then you read Matt's stuff and you go, fuck, it's so much deeper. And it's, 
and and you just kind of go, is this happening everywhere? And the answer is, yeah, it's happening everywhere. It's not just in these little corners. This is the stuff that's happening. And for an entrepreneur, it's actually, I think, very healthy. Because what you realize is there's so many things that are um, just nonsense that are in our world. And we have to put up with it and we have to deal with it and we have to navigate through it. And it's just part of our world. But much of that nonsense applies to the world of finance, the world of entrepreneurship, the world of business creation, the world of small business, the world of big business. And all of these things are part of our landscape. And so I'd encourage uh, looking for those kinds of thinkers, but still applying your own critical lens to it rather than, you know, taking it as, 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 as a gospel. There are plenty of things I said to, today I, I hope my L disagrees with, uh, and plenty of things I said today I hope you disagree with, and I would present it to you not as truth, but just as data from my frame of reference to incorporate into your own thinking rather than either truth or platitudes. Brad Feld said, well, I'm wrong a lot. And so it's just data that you have to process and decide what to do with. So I'm wrong a lot is a perfect conclusion to this conversation. Having said that, I do agree with with pretty much everything that I heard today. I think the the reading part is really, really important. I, I do find, again, having been an entrepreneur, that it, it's so easy to get stuck into the day to day and like just like always in the same in the same bubble. Uh, and, and so like reading stuff from the outside world is actually very, very helpful. I do love Matt emails, newsletters. I read them every morning. It's a fantastic writer. So I could not recommend it more. And with this, Brad, thank you so, so much for this time. Thanks to the 570 something people who attended this session. Uh, and we will try to do that again very soon. If you have the time. <laughs> I'm happy to. That was fun. And I'm just saying a thanks to everyone. <laughs>